Welcome to this movie on classical mechanics, which is part of a series of uh, videos I've made for my students in the second year course Classical Mechanics, which I teach at the Technical University of Delft. My name is Jos Thijssen. In this movie I would like to deal with the two-body problem, and I will do that from uh, starting from the Hamilton equations for that problem and um, it will lead in the end to the Kepler orbits which describe the motion of the planets around the Sun. I've made another movie on the same subject but that's rather lengthy so in case you find that too boring this may be an alternative and I hope you enjoy it. The two-body problem in classical mechanics describes the motion of two particles orbiting around each other. The particles are called m1 and m2, those are their masses. The positions are r1 and r2, and they interact via a potential which only depends on the distance between the two particles, so that's r2 minus r1 length of that vector. And that vector will occur more often, so we call it r, and its length is called r without a vector sign. Uh, the force on particle 1 is minus dv dr1, and it can be easily be shown that this is minus f2 in agreement with uh, Newton's third law. So we'll analyze this problem in the uh, formalism of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is given here as the total kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of particle 1 and 2, minus the potential energy. And so it seems useful to use the r, which is the relative coordinate, uh, which the length of which occurs as the argument of v, as uh, one coordinate. On the other hand, we know that for such a problem, the total center of mass velocity will not change. So we introduce the center of mass coordinate, which is given as m1 r1 plus m2 r2 divided by the total mass. So recall that m is always m1 plus m2. And we have a relative coordinate r, which is r2 minus r1. And it's useful to rewrite now the r1 and r2 in terms of this capital R and the lowercase r. So here I have done that. So we have written R1 in terms of the capital R and the lowercase r, and the same for R2. And uh, from these two equations that transition is rather straightforward. Now if you have those, you also know what the velocities are. You simply put dots over all the r's, and then you get these two lines. And now we are ready to attack the kinetic energy and to rewrite it it's now given in terms of r1 dot and r2 dot and we want to write it in terms of r capital r dot and lowercase r dot so that is what i've done here i have uh, substituted for the r1 dot here uh, the expression above and the same for r2 dot which i have replaced by this and then we first have a term which is proportional to the capital r dot squared and that term is easy to see, it's m1 plus m2 divided by 2. Uh, then we have a term proportional to r dot, capital R dot, uh, lowercase r dot, and that has a prefactor of m1, m2 over m and a minus sign. And from this I have a similar term, but that occurs with a plus sign. These terms are equal but opposite, equal in magnitude, opposite in sign, and so they nicely cancel. And then finally I have a term proportional to the little r dot squared and uh, we see that here we can extract a factor m1 plus m2 from the parenthesis and that allows us to streamline the equations a little bit. So first we have the term capital M over 2 capital R dot squared and then there is a term a half. So if I extract a factor of m1 plus m2 that cancels against one of the m's in the denominator, and so what I'm left with is m1 m2 r dot squared, and I'm going to write this as follows. The first term is simply coupled, copied, and the second term is written in the form mu over 2 r dot squared. 
mu is known as the reduced mass, so it's defined as this m1, m2 over m, capital M, and you can easily uh, recall what it is by uh, remembering 1 over, little, uh, 1 over the mu is 1 over the little m1 plus 1 over the little m2. So we can write up the Lagrangian now uh, in terms of the capital R, R and the small r. So these are the kinetic energies and here we have the potential. So we recall now that the, the center of mass kinetic energy uh, is constant because the r dot, the center of mass velocity is constant. So the first term is just a constant and we can leave that out for, of the problem. And so the interesting part is the Lagrangian of the relative motion and uh, that is just the last two terms. Another important remark is that we have now a 2D problem and the problem is only 2D because there uh, is a plane which is defined by the vector r uh, initially, so that's the relative position of the two masses and their velocities. So if we draw a picture then the two masses are lying in this plane and that plane is furthermore spanned by the initial velocity of uh, the relative coordinate and um, if the, the because the force is only along the line of the two particles it's not pointing outside of this plane and therefore this motion is in 2D and we can use polar coordinates for the relative coordinate so in particular for this kinetic energy. So let's do that. So we leave out the first term because it's constant and we can now write the L as mu over 2 r squared with a dot plus r squared phi dot squared minus vr. So we can write up the Lagrange equations and uh, we can start with the Lagrange equation for R which uh, is given as d dt and then we have the L the R dot. Uh, that is the same as mu R dot dot and then we have the derivative of L with respect to the little r. But we have of course first this term but there is an additional term and that term is coming from this r here. We shouldn't forget that. So there is an extra term which is mu r phi dot squared. And so in order to get a handle on the phi dot squared it's uh, useful to calculate or to write down the Lagrange equation of motion associated with the coordinate phi. So that's what I've done here and uh, we see that there is a conserved quantity because the time derivative of the term in parentheses is zero and we recognize that term as the uh, angular momentum perpendicular to the plane. So this is Lz and that's a kind of uh, that's R cross P for the relative motion. So that is a conserved quantity as we could expect because there are no external forces and then the uh, angular momentum is conserved. So calling this conserved quantity little l we can, re, uh, we can remove the phi dot from that equation using the definition for l, it's mu r squared phi dot. And so we can replace phi dot by something which depends on l, mu and r, and if we do that properly we get a plus l squared divided by mu r to the third. And so we see that mu r dot dot can be written as the direct force that the particles exert onto each, on each other and a term related to the angular momentum, and this is in fact a centrifugal force because the two bodies are orbiting around each other. And so uh, let us, as a final uh, step here at this stage, uh, try to write this as the gradient of just a single potential, because that's possible. We can write this as vr in parenthesis, and then we would get a plus l squared over 2 mu r squared. And so we see 
that we can write this as a single potential which is called the effective potential which is the direct interaction term between the two particles and there is a term associated with the centrifugal force and that's a centrifugal barrier the repulsive barrier between two particles as a final step in this uh, description I would like to emphasize that uh, what we have arrived at is an equation of motion of a one-dimensional particle it's described by the one-dimensional coordinate r and uh, its uh, force is given just by the gradient of a potential and that means that the total energy of this particle which is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy should be constant in time and that turns out to play a key role when we want to solve for the shape of the orbitals especially in the case of Kepler's problem. So now we want to apply the uh, uh, fact that the energy is constant and the fact that the angular momentum is also a conserved quantity to the particular case of the Kepler problem where it enables us to find exactly the shape of the orbitals that orbits that particles will traverse when they orbit around each other. So the Kepler problem is uh, characterized by a potential which is minus a constant divided by r, r being the distance, and a is a positive constant, and it describes the important cases of gravity, for example the planets orbiting around the Sun, and the Coulomb problem, for example, of an electron orbiting around the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So we emphasize again that we have two conserved quantities, one being e, which I will write again, it's mu over 2 r dot squared, and now I will write the v effective uh, explicitly, it's um, minus the plus the v as a function of r, so that's my minus a over r, and then there is an additional term which is l squared over 2 mu r squared. And the L is also a conserved quantity, it's mu r squared phi dot. So these two guys are conserved in time. So the trick in order to find the shape of the orbitals is to find out what d phi the r is, uh, rather than to find phi and r themselves explicitly as a function of time. And um, and that can be written, d phi the r can be written as phi dot divided by r dot since they are both uh, functions of time and if I then plug the r dot from here and the phi dot from there and I get this equation and if I streamline that a little bit it acquires this form and um, then we note that this can be rewritten essentially in the following way so doing away with all the constants and replacing them by a and b, we get this form, and that is an equa that is an integral we can in fact do. And it turns out that the result is the following. r is l squared divided by mu times a, which is the prefactor occurring with for the with the one over r potential, and then a one minus epsilon sine phi minus uh, some constant. So c is an arbitrary constant, that's not the case for the epsilon. The epsilon which uh, I have introduced here is the square root of 1 plus 2 e l squared divided by mu a squared. Now you, know, you should of course first of all distinguish between the two cases. First is uh, e is greater than 0. That means that uh, we don't have a particle orbiting around the center but it will fly away. Uh, because the energy, the kinetic energy is apparently bigger than the potential energy and so in that case we have epsilon greater than 1 and it turns out that this equation then uh, describes a hyperbola. If E is equal to 0, that's just the point where the particle can just escape, that corresponds to epsilon equal to 1 we have a parabola and for the case where E is smaller than 1 we have an ellipse. Then there is another 
special case and that is the case where epsilon so this is the case for negative energies and if epsilon equals zero then we have a circle and you can easily see that from the solution if epsilon is zero you see that r is constant so it doesn't vary with the phi and that's typical for a circular motion so here you see a simple python program which i wrote in order to solve the equation of motion for a particle in two dimensions and i will show how that program works for the kepler problem so I will not go into the details of the Python or of the plotting part of this program, but just focus on the dynamics, which uh, tells you how the particle's positions evolve. The position is uh, encoded into a vector r, which is two-dimensional. The velocities are given by the vector p, momentum, also two dimensions, and I take the mass equal to one, so p is just the velocity in this case. The initial conditions are that the particle is released on the x-axis at 1, 0 and it leaves the x-axis with a velocity in the y-direction of 0.4. Uh, the solution proceeds by moving the particle step by step and uh, the time elapsing between two time steps is 0 0.0005. Now I take the Kepler force the gravitational force as minus one over r so the prefactor is simply minus one and if i calculate the force from this potential i get minus the vector r divided by r to the third and you see that that is encoded here in this uh, function which calculates the force so we have minus r divided by r to the third then the actual solution takes place in this part of the program and it's done in the so-called velocity verle algorithm which i will not go into in detail but it's a very simple and uh, accurate way of solving equations of motion of course the uh, part which really determines the shape of the orbit is this the call to force if i would change the force i get a different motion and so it is interesting to see what we get uh, from this program so when I press the enter key the program starts running and we see that we get a perfect ellipse which is quite eccentric and it's uh, so this is the attraction of the center of attraction this is the origin and we see that the particle passes very close by the attraction center the uh, orbit is a closed ellipse and it is, this ellipse is traversed several tens of times but uh, we do not see that because it's each time the same orbit so you don't see the particle really moving so it is interesting to study the case where the force is not a pure Kepler force but where it's slightly distorted as you can see here I have introduced a parameter eta which I will take small and it gives you a distortion from the gravitational potential uh, and the force that I can derive from this it's also an easy calculation it's 1 plus eta r divided by r to the power 3 plus eta so the only thing which I changed in the program the only essential change is this introduction of the parameter eta which I've done here according to to this formula and so it is interesting then to see what happens uh, I will take the eta the first zero so then we get the previous case where we have a pure Kepler orbit and that's drawn in blue then we will see the orbit for eta equal to 0 0.01 and then I will take eta minus 0 0.01 and that will the last two will be respectively a green and a red curve okay so let's see what we get when we start the program first we see obviously the blue curve just as before the close Kepler orbit because that was the case where eta was zero then the green curve you see that it's no longer a closed orbit but it's a precessing ellipse and it precesses in the positive y direction then the red curve corresponds to eta minus 0 0.01 
and that gives me a curve that precesses in the negative y direction. So you see that the fact that the orbit is closed in the Kepler case is really a special feature of the form of that potential which is the 1 over r potential. So let us enjoy the beautiful picture once again. Here you see the closed blue curve and then the precessing green and red curves which correspond to a slight distortion from the pure gravitational force.